You know, uh, there was a young man long, long time ago who lived in England. Uh, he, was in his, he was a teenager. His name was Maywin Socket. Fun name. Everybody say it. Maywin Socket. Sometimes it's just fun to say it. Maywin Socket. Well, he was about 16 years old when some Irish pirates attacked his city. And uh, in attacking his city, they took young Maywin captive, prisoner. And they carted him off on their ship, and they went back to Ireland, and they had young Maywin with them, 16 years old. Uh, but instead of killing him, as they often did with you know, other people they attacked, they took him as a slave and made him their shepherd. And he took care of their sheep that they would eat and that provided you know, uh, wool and whatnot for their little community, the pirate community. Uh, and he was with them for a number of years. But what's interesting about this, uh, young May, when he, he knew about God culturally uh, as, as an Englishman, he knew about him, but he didn't really follow God, he didn't believe in Jesus. But as a slave, he began to pray. Every day, he would pray. As he's taking care of those sheep, he would pray. As those pirates would come and go, consistently threatening his life, he would pray. And through the course of this prayer, he discovered something. He discovered an understanding of Jesus. He got a hold of Scripture, and he began to read about Jesus. And as a slave, young Maywin believed in Jesus. He became a follower of Jesus, a Christian. And he was able to escape a number of years later after having been a slave. Walking away, having no love for Ireland, he made it back home to Britain with almost a hatred for Ireland because of how he had been treated. Well, he gets home to Britain, and while he's there, he has a revelation, a vision from the Lord that says, I want you to go back to Ireland. And he says, no, God, are you kidding me? Those are the pirates. Those are the people who came and killed a bunch of people. Those are the people who took me away from my home and my family when I was 16. And God just said to him again, I want you to go back. Well, the young man believed in Jesus and wanted to follow Jesus' path for him. So he said, okay. And he became a, a minister of the gospel and went back to Ireland as a missionary. Ireland at that point had not heard the gospel. Many believe no one had in Ireland. They worshipped a whole bunch of gods. Uh, it was Celtic polytheism was what it was called. And they worshipped a bunch of gods. And this young man comes in there and he begins to tell people about Jesus as he's walking around this country. Everyone he comes to, he tells about Jesus. And in the process, people get saved left, right, and center. And he starts church after church after church. And he starts uh, putting different pastors over these churches as he's telling all these people about Jesus. And he has such a dynamic impact on the nation of Ireland that they give him a sainthood after he dies. And that's the very reason we celebrate today wearing green is because of St. Patrick was that young man who was kidnapped at 16. So it's not about wearing green. It's not about going to your favorite restaurant and having some St. Patrick deal. St. Patrick was a young man who loved Jesus and wanted everyone to come to know Jesus. And he came to know Jesus. He came to know the freedom of the gospel while he was a slave, while he was bound, while he was imprisoned. Well, what we're going to see today from Acts chapter 16 is the same concept. A lot of us may find ourselves imprisoned by a wide variety of things by something physical, something emotional, something mental. We may find that we're imprisoned by this thing. It could be something we've been carrying around since we were a child, something somebody said to us, the, the way somebody looks at us or sees us. It could be uh, uh, some offense. It could be some unforgiveness that we're harboring. It could be any number of things, and, and it's got us imprisoned in our lives. Well, I'm here to tell you just as St. Patrick came to know, just as we're going to see today in Acts chapter 16, freedom comes from your spirit, not because of some physical shackles falling off. It becomes because of the presence of Jesus in your life. So turn to Acts chapter 16. It'll be on the screen. Uh, you can look in the YouVersion Bible app under the events section, find it there. Uh, you can use a, a Bible on the rack on page 925. Uh, you can find uh, Acts chapter 16. So in Acts chapter 16, we come across the Apostle Paul, 
And he's going around telling people about Jesus. And he's got a team of guys with him. And, and as they're going around, they get into trouble in some places because some people don't like the fact that they're telling other people about Jesus. Well, Acts chapter 16 describes just such a situation. We're going to start in verse 16. Uh, it's written, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So, so right off the bat, we come and they're in this city and there's a slave girl there who's got a demon in her and that gives her the ability to fortune t- to uh, uh, tell some sort of a future and uh, people would pay to have this, this, their future read and that would bring a great um, living to this girl's owners. Well, she starts following Paul and Silas and his team around, verse 17. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, (laughs) sometimes we see guys in Scripture and we say, man, these guys are super spiritual. You know, these guys are phenomenal men of God, women of God. They're, they're nothing like me, nothing like us. Well, here you see just the transparency of Paul. I mean, here's this girl walking behind them. He knows she's possessed by a demon, and yet she's declaring the truth. These guys declare the way to salvation. And she's just shouting it over and over and over. Probably Paul can't even get a word out in trying to tell people about Jesus because this girl's just screaming. And it says Paul becomes greatly annoyed at her. And in his annoyance, he just turns and tells the demon to get out. He's just tired of this mess. He's just tired. Just stop talking. You ever feel like saying that to somebody? Just stop talking. I command the demon of talking to come out of you. And Paul, in his great annoyance, turns to this girl and commands the demon to come out. But remember, her her having that demon brought great amount of wealth to the guys who owned her. And so this was going to cause a problem. Verse 19. But... When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. Now, that word disturbing, it literally means causing people to riot. It's not just they're causing a ruckus. It's not just they're causing a disturbance. It, it, the implication here from what these guys are saying is they are causing a riot in the city. And they're telling this to the rulers. They're telling this to the judges, the magistrates. These guys are Jews, which you have to understand, first century Roman culture was vastly different than 21st century American culture. Uh, not long before this time period, there had been a, a pervasive Um, racial hatred of Jews throughout the Roman Empire, Uh, so much so that Caesar, right before this time uh, of Acts chapter 16, kicked all of the Jews out of Rome, said, if you were a Jew, you're not allowed to be in city limits whatsoever, or we will take care of business. And so he kicked them all out. And so this wasn't just something that went on in Rome, it went throughout the entire country, the entire empire, the entire culture. And so these guys are are, are speaking some racial, you know, uh, motivated things here, to the magistrates. They want these guys to know, these are Jews, and if you like Caesar, who hates Jews, then you're not gonna like these guys. And not only are they Jews, they're Jews who came here, and they're starting a riot among the people in your city, what are you gonna do about it? Even though these guys weren't doing anything of the sort. These guys are just mad, these these slave owners are just mad because Paul took the demon out of their slave. And so they say these things, they're causing a riot. Verse 21, they continue talking. They say, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Now, you understand, too, Rome, the Roman Empire, had very strict anti-cult laws. Anti-cult. You weren't allowed to participate in a cult. It was, you know, it was illegal to do that. And anything that, and the only way that your religion could be classified not a cult is was that it had a seal of approval from the government. You could bring your, your thing, this is my new religion, you take it to the government and they have to give it a seal of approval. Otherwise, they would deem it a cult and illegal. And so now they are saying that they advocate customs that are not lawful for us to do as Romans. 
That's what they're saying. They're saying not only are they causing a riot, not only are they Jews, but they're breaking the law again because they are doing cultish things and they're trying to get other people to do cultish things. And so they're breaking the law all over the place. And they're bringing this before the magistrates. And so this is what happens. Verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now, what you see here is what, what happens a lot of times, even today, and maybe not to this physical extreme, but these two guys, these slave owners, go to the magistrates, and they're mad because their slave can't bring them as much money anymore. Uh, and so they fabricate this story, and it turns into this massive deal. They, 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 they stir people up into a frenzy. And it's kind of easy to stir people up into a frenzy, frenzy sometimes. And so they do this politically, they do this racially, they get the magistrates on their side, and in doing so they also get the crowd on their side. And now you've got Paul and Silas here, not the whole team, just Paul and Silas. Because Paul and Silas are actually the only two guys who are 100% uh, uh, Jews. The rest of their team uh, were either Gentiles or half-Jews. So they weren't carted in here in front of them, just Paul and Silas, because, you know, they're full-blood Jews. And so they're there, and they're getting all the hatred from these two guys, from the magistrates, from the crowd is now screaming and shouting things. And so the magistrates take Paul and Silas, rip their clothes off, and beat them with rods. Now, again, it's hard for us today in American culture to really kind of understand uh, uh, first century Roman culture, it was commonplace for people to get beaten, but especially by people who were government officials. They had authority to beat, let, I mean, all over. They could, they could just drag you out if you just said the wrong thing or if they thought you said something in the wrong tone. They could take you out in the street and beat you. I read a story this week uh, in studying what, you know, this beating, you know, uh, mentality uh, of one guy who was over a city who just didn't like the way this other guy said something in his trial and just started beating him in the eyeballs in the trial. He ended up dying as a result. It turned out the guy really hadn't done anything wrong. But the Roman official didn't get in trouble because he was a Roman official. And so his, his word was law. And so they say, okay, these guys are Jews. Okay, these guys are causing a riot. Let's rip their clothes off, grab those big old sticks, and just start beating them with them. And they did. And so here's Paul and Silas. They were just in town telling people about Jesus. They helped this one girl by, by bringing a demon out of her. And now all of a sudden, they're naked, getting beaten with big rods. Not just like little, growing up, we had a paddle in our house that we got spanked with sometimes. It had a Bible verse on it, so you know, you couldn't do anything to it. It had a Bible verse on it. It was, you know, it was holy, right? Uh, but these weren't those kind of deals. These, were, these weren't even a switch you'd pull off a tree. These were big, massive sticks that had been whittled and cut to inflict the most amount of pain. And they were beating Paul and Silas just repeatedly over and over and over, nonstop beating. Sometimes for us, it may feel like we have circumstances or people that will pile on to us, that will just be coming against us, and it's like nonstop. It feels like it's, like it's just repeated. We just can't get out from under the pressure. We just can't get out from under the anxiety, and it feels overwhelming because I don't know how, you, how it works with you, but if one thing goes wrong, five things go wrong. It's never just one. Right? It's all, if, if, you're, if your washing machine breaks, your dishwasher's going to break, and you're going to blow a tire. You know, it's that kind of deal. The other day, I took our, uh, our, our vehicle into the shop because, you know, I was like, why do the tires keep, you know, especially this one tire, it keeps losing air. And the guy at the tire shop said, oh, hey, you got a nail in three of your tires. I was like, oh, well, we need to get those fixed. Uh, it wasn't just one tire, it was three of them. It's never just one thing, it's always a bunch. And so here you got Paul and Silas before the magistrates, you got these two guys piling on them, then you got the magistrates piling on them, then you got the whole crowd piling on them, then you got these other guys who their only job, later on in the passage, it calls them the police, but in, in truth, their only job was to beat people. They were the beaters, that was their job. And so they, 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 the magistrates turn to the beater guys and say, all right, grab, we, you know, grab the rods this time instead of the whips or the other things with the nails in them. Grab the rods and come and beat these two guys. And so they do. They grab them. They beat them. And so every, it's like everybody in the city hates their guts. It's, and sometimes with us, it feels like we just, 
We can't do anything right because we're getting blasted at work. We're getting blasted at home. We're getting blasted with this health scare. We can't handle this financial issue. Our, our kids are off the rails doing crazy things, and stuff is just, just, just not right. We can't get our life to be good, and it feels like we're in bondage. It feels like we're imprisoned. But here, when the attacks come, we need to realize, realize that it's not on us to be able to pull ourselves out. We don't have the strength to be able to pull ourselves out of those situations. We don't have the forearm strength to, to, to grip whatever we need to grip, to, to, to hold firm in the midst of the storm. We need to go to the originator of strength and allow him to hold on to us as the storm winds blow. This very thing was happening in the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 20. It says that Peshur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. Now there's a lot there. Jeremiah is a prophet of God. He gets taken and beaten by this guy and then put in the stocks that are in the, house of, that are in the temple, that are in the church. He gets beaten and then put in the church as a prison. And look at what Jeremiah says in verse 10. He says, I hear many whisperings, terror on every side. Have you ever been in a situation in your life when it feels like you hear many whisperings? You're not good enough. You can't do that. You can't handle that. That's too big. You're going to fail at this. You don't have enough money for this. This isn't going to work. That person's going to think this. this. Your health isn't going to last here. The doctor's going to say this, and the medicine's not going to do what it needs to do, and that's going to happen, and this is going to happen. And, and I, I mean, it may not be you, but even yesterday I had a situation when I felt like it was many whisperings. Many whisperings, and Jeremiah says, it's terror on every side. But he doesn't leave it there. He says this in verse 11, the next verse. The Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. Now this, I, I'm just going to be, this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. The Lord is a dread warrior. A dread warrior. You know what the literal translation of dread warrior is? The Hebrew is gibor aritz. The literal translation of, the, of those two words, dread warrior, is a violent hero. It says the Lord is a violent hero. The Lord is a mighty warrior. He is the strong one. No one, he says there, no one will overcome me because he is with me. Jeremiah, while he's in the stocks, in the temple, bleeding because of his beating, he says, this is not the end for me because I am with the Lord. And that is where we're going to find Paul and Silas. That is where we're going to find ourselves in our own situations when we may feel overwhelmed, when we may feel imprisoned, when we may feel burdened because the spirit in me is more powerful than whatever attacks life can throw at me. The spirit in me is more powerful than any attacks that life may throw at me. It may seem overwhelming. It may seem like we can't get out from under the pressure and the anxiety and the burden. But the spirit of God that is in me is more powerful than that thing. The very words of Jeremiah, they will not overcome me because the Lord is a dread warrior and he is with me. Look at verse 23 of Acts chapter 16. Paul, Silas, beaten. Verse 23, when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safe. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, what's interesting here is archaeologists have actually found this very prison. They found it. They dug it up. It's a little place. I mean, I mean, it was big, but it was short, uh, and it was dark, no windows. It was this place, they took them, they had the normal prison, and then way back up, almost in a little cave, back part were these other cells, like the bad cells, I mean, tiny, tiny cells. I know guys back then were shorter than they are today, but it was a little place. And they put them in the stocks, it said. And stocks aren't like what you see, you know, uh, you know uh, on the comically portrayed on movies and TV, not something you like stick your head in, you can pull it out and all this mess. They were these stocks that were, had really small leg holes and screws in them that would uh, 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 rub up against their legs and screw into the rock beneath. So they hurt. 
They hurt. I mean, terribly. And the tightness of these stocks were such that you could not readjust your position if you got uncomfortable, if you got where you were sitting in one place too long and it hurt. You weren't, you, they were so tight, you couldn't do that. And if you did move, it would just scrape your leg and cause all kinds of abrasions and cuts because of the screws and the tightness and the roughness of the stock themselves. And so they're taken and they're thrown into the inner prison. They're thrown into the darkness. They've got these painful stocks on them. They're still bleeding from their beating with the rods. And they're in this prison, in the stocks there. You know, something, it, it just blows my mind, these, this perception of them sitting there in the dark, in this tiny place. And the way these were situated, remember I told you the cells were small. So if they're sitting down, their back is against the wall, and they've got their feet in the stocks, and their feet are touching the bars of the front of the jail. That's how small it is. And you've got one guy here, one guy here. You can't stretch your arm out the wall of the other end of the cell is about as far as your elbow. Same for the other guy, and that's how small your cell is. And you're sitting there with your feet up against the thing and the screws and the stocks. And, and you're not able to lean back. Remember, it's a straight wall, so you're kind of hunched over a little bit. And they're in there, still bleeding in the dark, and this situation is going on. And I know what I would be thinking in that moment. <laughs> I would not be very happy. <laughs> I might be a little discouraged, might be a little frustrated. My, my rights as a citizen have just been violated, and that's not where we find them. But when it comes to us, we may find ourselves sometimes going through a torturous situation, something that we cannot get out of, something that it feels like it's just, just, just pressing in on us and we can't get away from it whether it's our job and the expectations that come with it or the job's not providing enough for our family. It could be a health thing, a health thing from us or from somebody close to us and, and, and it's unbearable or an unbearable grief or it could be an anxiety that we're hanging on to because of some of these other things and, and it's, it's closing in on us. If you feel like we're in the dark, we could be discouraged, we could be worried about money, our kids could be going crazy, doing crazy things, our parents' health could be going downhill and we don't know how to handle that situation. It could be something going on at school, it could be a, a pride issue that we've never dealt with. It could be someone has offended you and said something that made you frustrated and angry. Or it could be a perceived offense. You thought they did this and you thought they meant that and you thought they, they, they said this when they posted it on social media and this is what they meant and you're offended by that and you get frustrated and that per uh, perceived offense develops into unforgiveness and that turns into bitterness and your soul turns into something you don't even recognize anymore because it's a chain reaction because you didn't deal with the initial perceived offense and it's something that is weighing on you and it's got you chained to the ground and you can't get out from under it and you don't know where to go with this thing. Well, Paul and Silas, having been physically beaten, emotionally beaten, they're in a different frame of mind than I would have been, to be honest with you. Look at verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They're not shaken. <laughs> They're full of hope. They're full of joy. They're full of peace. They're praying, not quietly praying. And they're praying loudly so everyone in the jail can hear them. They're singing loudly so everyone in the jail can hear them. They're, they are full of hope. Because prison cannot imprison the free. Prison cannot imprison the free. No matter how bad the prison is, no matter how bad the emotional prison is or the mental prison is or even the physical prison, it, the prison cannot imprison the free. If you are free in Jesus, you are not bound by these other things. Here, Paul and Silas in this prison, in the darkest part of the night, they said it's midnight, the darkest part of the night, they are singing music, celebrating, celebrating the fact that they have Jesus as they're bleeding onto the ground in the darkest part of this terrible Roman prison. When it comes to the darkest part of the night, the darkest part of a situation, 
What kind of music pours from your soul, pours from your mind or your mouth when you're facing an uncertain midnight? What kind of music pours from you? What kind of reaction do you have to the moment? Music really, for them, it demonstrated the true nature of their hearts. They were full of peace. They were full of joy. They were full of Jesus, and they were expressing it in their reaction to their situation because their situation didn't determine their demeanor. Their position with Jesus determined how they saw the world. So even though they were physically in prison, they were not bound by that prison. They were going to follow Jesus and his impression on their lives no matter what they were facing. So as they're singing, as they're praying, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So they prayed, they sang, and then all of the prison doors were opened. They set the captives free. It would seem that this was an answer to prayer, right? Let us out of jail, let us go. Earthquake happens, all the, the, the doors fly open that were not made to fly open somehow. This was a miracle earthquake that did it. Not only that, all of the screws that were fastening their stocks into the rock came undone and popped out. So they were free, but they weren't free in that sense because they were already free when they were locked up. From Paul and Silas' perspective, they weren't in prison as a punishment for them. Being in prison meant God had something for them to do in prison. Having been singing, having been praying, everything shifted. Look at verse 26, or 27. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. You see, if you were the jailer, everyone in the jail was your responsibility. If anything happened to them under your watch, you would be held responsible for it. More often than not, if something happened to them and they escaped, you were taken out and you were killed, often by beheading. And so the jailer, having been asleep, probably fell asleep listening to these guys singing, feels the earthquake and wakes up, and he looks down towards the darkest part, the inner part of the prison. He can't see a whole lot, but he can see the doors, all of them, open. He can't hear anything. They're not singing anymore. And he fears instantly they're all gone. They're all gone. And I'm going to be taken out into the street and killed because I let them escape. So he draws his sword to kill himself. And Paul and Silas, sitting back in the inner part of the prison, in the darkest part, can see the jailer and what he's doing. Because if you're in the dark, you can see the light pretty well. And they can see out there, and they can see this jailer, what he's about to do. And Paul yells out, verse 28. Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now this is remarkable to me. You see, Paul and Silas know Jesus. Paul and Silas know that they're free in Jesus, that even though they're in prison, they're not really in prison because they've got Jesus. They're really free even though they're still locked up. And knowing Jesus for them was what kept them rooted to the spot because Jesus had something for them to do. But why did everybody else in the prison stay put? Why did they all stay in their cells? No one else moved. I mean, Paul and Silas being where they were, they would have heard anybody else running out of the prison. They would have possibly seen some of that, but nobody moved because they were where uh, 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 Paul and Silas being there knew that no one else had moved. I mean, if I were one of those guys in those other cells, you know, Romans were nuts when it came to how they punished prisoners, and you never know what was going to happen the next day. You might have been the first guy bolting from that place, especially when you see the jailers asleep. But nobody left. Nobody left. What we see here is that the other prisoners in there were responding to how they had been influenced by Paul and Silas's praying and singing. Paul and Silas's verbal exclamation of the power of God resonated through the entire prison so much so that no one left when they were given the opportunity to do so. No one bolted. No one tried to escape. Everyone stayed there. 
Their hope that they had within them spread to the entire prison, out through the bars, into the other cells, came from their mouths into the ears and hearts of everyone there. And the hope that they expressed changed lives that day. Because hope is not limited by the bars of a jail cell. Hope is not limited by your own body. Hope cannot be contained. Hope is limitless, and it pours out continually on everyone around. And so Paul and Silas were demonstrating this hope to everyone. And and even though you may feel limited sometimes, you may feel imprisoned sometimes, your hope is not. Your hope can be spread around to anybody and everybody, no matter the constraints you may feel on yourself, how you respond. If you demonstrate hope in Jesus and not the negativity of the circumstance, you can change lives. You see, the the hope of Paul and Silas didn't just change the lives of the prisoners, but by changing the lives of the prisoners, it also changed the lives of the jailer that day. Look at verse 29. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul and Silas. The the jailer comes in and says, What must I do to be saved? And so instantly, the question here is, in response to this man's statement, What must I do to be saved? Is how does he know these guys know the way to salvation? Obviously, he's been listening to their prayers. He's been listening to their songs. Quite possibly, Paul and Silas were praying for the salvation of the jailer who was keeping them in prison. We know Paul did that on other occasions. That could have been what's going on here. And this jailer, in response to the hope demonstrated by Paul and Silas, comes in and sees this miracle of everyone still there and no one escaping, says, what must I do to have what you have? How can I get that same hope? How can I be saved? Paul says, believe in Jesus. Having not fled to physical freedom, Paul and Silas were able to introduce this man to true freedom. They introduced him to freedom that day because true freedom is not a condition of the body and mind. True freedom is a condition of the heart. True freedom is a condition of the heart. It's not about how mentally free you are, how financially free you are, how how free you are in your life to make whatever decisions you can make. It's about how free you are in your spirit and in your heart. Because you can be as free in the world, being able to do whatever you want to do, but be imprisoned in your soul because you don't know Jesus. And it is crippling. Here Paul and Silas, having nothing in the world, bound up, naked in a jail cell, bleeding all over the ground, knew true freedom, and the man who had freedom came to them in prison wanting to know how he could have it too. Freedom is a condition of the heart. Verse 32, so they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and they took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Paul and Silas' joy led to the joy of their captor. And he went immediately and got baptized in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. He didn't wait for a certain day. And today, if you've never been baptized after you have believed in Jesus, we can do it. We can do it. You don't have to wait for a certain thing. You, you can do it. We, you have to wait for us to fill up the baptistry, but you can do it. We can take care of it. You don't have to do certain things or be certain things. Baptism doesn't bring salvation, but baptism really displays what's happened in your spirit, in your heart. And we can do it today if you need to be baptized. If you need to be baptized, we can do it next week. You can grab people, bring them, and we can do it next week. But if you've never been baptized, man, let's take care of it. Here's a guy in the middle of the night gets baptized because he can't wait. He's so excited. And he goes and he gets baptized and he brings Paul and Silas who have been demonstrating this joy. And like I said earlier, if it were me in prison, I don't know how joyful I would have been sitting there. I would have been wallowing in that prison. I would have been thinking about all of the legal ramifications of how can I get out of here? They violated my rights. I need to do this and this and this and this and they're going to get theirs and they're going to get fired and all. they're going to be in this jail cell and all this and that and the other thing. But 
That's not what Paul and Silas were doing. They were being joyful. They were being full of hope because they had been allowing their spirit to feed on the hope of Jesus. They weren't feeding on the negativity of the moment, on the negativity of their situation and their circumstance and how this had been violated and their rights here had been violated and they'd, gotten, you know, they'd been wrongly accused of whatever. They weren't focused on any of that. All they were focused on is Jesus. Because when it comes to our spirit, our attitude, our demeanor, our motivations, what you feed is what grows. If you feed on negativity constantly, that's what's going to grow in you and it will spread to others in the same way. If you feed on Jesus and joy and peace and hope, that is what will spread to others. Imagine if Paul and Silas, instead of praying and singing hymns of celebration, were complaining about how they had been violated and how their rights had been abused. Everyone in that jail would have run out and that jailer would have killed himself that night. But that's not what they were focused on. They weren't feeding on the negative. They were feeding on the joy. And that's what grew. That's what changed everyone's life in that prison that day. Paul and Silas fed on the joy and it changed everyone. It grew into the life of the jailer. You know, Craig Rochelle, he's a pastor in Oklahoma. He said it this way. Your life moves in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life moves in the direction of your strongest thoughts. That if this is what you're thinking about constantly, that's where your life's going to end up going. If this is what is consuming you, even this type of thought, whether negative or positive or all about Jesus, that's where your life is going to end up going and the influence you're going to end up having on those around you. What you feed grows. But you've got to know this. The enemy does not want you to know the availability of the power and freedom in Jesus. He doesn't want you to know how much power you have in Jesus. He doesn't want you to know how much freedom you have in Jesus. And so he will introduce all kinds of distractions into your life to keep you from understanding the great thing that it is to know Jesus, the power that is available, the, the freedom and the peace and the joy and the hope that can be there in Jesus. And he will try to pull you away from any of those things. If you've ever read screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis writing it from the perspective of a demon trying to tempt a guy, uh, it, it, it comes to a point in one particular instance of a higher up demon writing to a lower level demon saying, your main priority is simply to distract him from the Lord, to keep him from knowing what God wants for him. We need to not be distracted. The enemy will tempt to distract us uh, uh, physically and emotionally and mentally in all kinds of ways and keep us away from the main thing that is pointing people to Jesus. And we'll get caught in the periphery, caught in the stuff that doesn't really matter and miss the main thing that this, this world is all about pointing people to Jesus. It's not about the fact that you had an extra $2 on your, 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 your uh, 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 internet bill and you call and chew the guy out on the other end of the phone who had nothing to do with that typo, but you chew him out instead of pointing him to Jesus and ruin your witness that day and he ends up like the jailer before Paul and Silas injected Jesus into his life. Is $2 really worth that guy's eternity? We need to be pointing people to Jesus not screaming about how we have been violated or how we, our, our rights have been abused and, and this person put the wrong thing on our, on our bill today at lunch and, and, and we go off and we lose our witness in the restaurant because we're focused on this and not on Jesus. Because when it comes to a head, whether it's one year, five years, 10 years, 100 years, you're gonna have to stand before Jesus. And if... What you did in that restaurant that one day, what you did on the phone with that one person, is it really going to matter anymore in the face of eternity? I mean, right now, we're all living just the first hundred years of our lives. I mean, we're going to live after we die, guys. And this is just the first little bit. And so some of that stuff isn't going to matter. All that really matters is the stuff that's going to last forever, the stuff that goes on to, into eternity. That's why Paul and Silas were in the prison singing and praying because they knew that this prison was going to pass. Even if they were to die the next day, this was going to pass. Because eternity is what matters. Jesus is what matters. Freedom in Jesus is what matters. And if you believe in Jesus, he sets you free from all of that mess, from all 
of that stuff. Jesus himself said that in John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Nothing can hold you in prison. Nothing can bind you up. Nothing can keep you a slave if you have Jesus. Because if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Nothing can undo what Jesus already did. He introduces into your life this joy and gives you the Holy Spirit, God's very Spirit, the moment you believe. And when he does that, something unique also happens. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, that the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if you have Jesus, you've been set free. Jesus said it in John 8. If, if you have Jesus, you have the Spirit of the Lord. And he, Paul writes it, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And those whispers may come, just like Jeremiah wrote, that try to convince you that you're not free, try to convince you that this world is terrible and this is all there is, and try to whisper into your mind and, and pull you to a place of great anxiety and burden and imprisonment. But all the while, we have these great principles and truths that say, no, the Son has set you free. No, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Because no matter what anyone else may say, no matter what your circumstances may say, no matter what your bank account may say, no matter what the doctor's going to say on Tuesday, you are free and let nobody else tell you otherwise. Not even yourself. Not even yourself in those whispers in your own mind. You may try to convince yourself that you are not truly free and the enemy will try to distract you from what God has for you, but you are free. That addiction does not hold weight over you because of Jesus. Jesus sets you free. You can find freedom in him. It may still be a battle. It may still be ongoing because in this world you will have struggle. We know that you will have difficulty. We know that, but we take heart. John chapter 16, because he has overcome the world. Because he has overcome the world. We haven't been conquered by this world. We haven't been conquered by that addiction. We haven't been conquered by the overwhelming anxiety. We are conquerors because we are with Jesus. He is a dread warrior walking with us through the mess and the struggle and the battle. We may get battle weary, but he never does. Never does. If you have Jesus, you are free and he fights for you in the midst of those trying to imprison you maybe today you don't have jesus and you don't know him and you've never known this freedom you've never known this peace all you've ever known is anxiety and struggle and you feel like you've just constantly beaten down you feel like paul and silas in the prison locked up in the tininess of the deal and you can't get out and you feel like you're wallowing in your filth and the blood that is there and you can't escape I'm telling you right now, you can find freedom in Jesus if you believe that he's the son of God, that he died so all your sins are forgiven. All those things the enemy keeps bringing up, trying to shame you with, he died so those things are forgiven, and it's over. And then he rose from the dead so you can live after you die, and in that there is freedom, that not even death has power over you. Know Jesus today. Know Jesus today. Believe that today. And if you believe it today, it's settled for all time. It's settled for all time. You don't have to, in a week, because you sin, uh, in a week, that doesn't undo your salvation. You don't lose your salvation because you're going to sin this afternoon. You can never, you are not, <laughs> you are not powerful enough to undo what Jesus did in his death and resurrection. You're not. You can't undo it. It's there forever. But because of his power in that, Nothing else has power over us because he's with us. Nothing has power over you because of Jesus. So come to believe in Jesus today and find freedom with whatever is binding you up, has you locked in prison. Give it to Jesus. Give it to him. You may have access to freedom. You're, the, the jail cell is open, the stocks are off, but you're still sitting in the prison and don't even know that you're free. The freedom is there. Walk in it today.